For thousands of years, the prophecies contained in the Bible remain cryptic, even mysterious symbols of heads, horns, and beasts. Great Bible expositors like John Calvin and Martin Luther passed on the opportunity to write commentaries on Daniel or the book of Revelation. It was widely regarded as symbolic rather than literal. In this generation, the books of Daniel and the Apocalypse read like today's headlines. The ancient Hebrew prophets gave clear and identifiable signs that would signal his return. He spoke of natural disasters, political and economic developments, climatic changes, a rise in incurable disease, and a host of other things. It validated the prophecies of the last days contained in the Old Testament and gave additional insight into the last generation to the Apostle John who recorded them in what we call the Book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. The prophets said that the restoration of Israel an event that could only happen once in the future would be the landmark event. He said that the generation that would see the complete fulfillment of Bible prophecy would witness this. Now since Israel's restoration took place on May 14, 1948, it seems only logical that the other signs he gave would also be connected in some way to that point in history. The connection is clear and unmistakable. Watch the nightly newscasts and compare the information in the Bible with the events reported on TV news broadcast. If you're honest with all these facts, it is obvious that something is happening. It is just as obvious as you will see that this is the generation Jesus referred to when he said, this generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. <laughs> Events that the Bible foretold thousands of years in advance lay dormant until their appointed time in history. At that point, things began to come together with amazing speed and incredible precision. You won't want to miss any of this special examining the 1948 equation. The prophet Daniel was given a sweeping vision of the history that would lead right up to the last days. It terrified him. He asked the revealing angel to explain all that he had seen. He was told, quote, But you, O Daniel, shut up or encrypt the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. End quote. One thing about Daniel, he was persistent. He repeated this request again. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are literally encrypted and sealed till the time of the end. end quote. The angel gave additional details, not for Daniel, but for the generation that would live to unlock the secrets of Daniel's vision. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise in spiritual insight shall understand. The 21st century more than fits Daniel's description of end time society. A person can board an aircraft in New York and touch down in Tokyo in a matter of hours. Daniel was taken captive to Iraq from Jerusalem, a distance of maybe 600 miles. It took Daniel months. Today, 600 miles is a day trip by car, a hundred years ago, it took weeks or even months to get from New York to L.A. The slowest method of making the trip today is by car. Four days if you don't push too hard. An airline strike can cripple business. A prolonged disruption can cripple national economies. Thanks to the Internet, distance is immaterial. Physical location is no barrier to communication. A person surfing the net in Buenos Aires is as physically connected to a server site in Los Angeles as if he were actually sitting in the L.A. site's computer room. 
Daniel lived in the 6th century BC. For the next 25 centuries, the most common form of rapid transit was the horse. A hundred years ago, that all changed, and today we can travel to and fro almost instantaneously. Daniel was told that the same generation that would see the book unsealed or the apocalypse code broken would live in a time of increasing knowledge. Since the close of World War II, our knowledge base has been growing exponentially. In fact, a computer expert named Scott Kane told me that the entire knowledge base is growing at an exponential rate so that it is doubled every four months. Remember, at the beginning of the Second World War, transatlantic air travel was a technological miracle. By the war's end, jet aircraft had seen combat. The Enola Gay dropped an atomic weapon from a pressurized aircraft at 30,000 feet, heretofore impossible. Within a matter of years, network television replaced radio. Transistors made computers possible. The villages of the world merged into a single global village, wired together to make everywhere here and everything now. Well, prior to the transistor, computers operated using vacuum tubes. Now, they ran too hot and were too fragile for the computer to be anything more than a scientific oddity. In a very real sense, the computer age was born with the invention of the transistor by Bell Labs in, you guessed it, 1948. Since the birth of the personal computer, it has been estimated that the speed and power of computer chips double every 18 months. It's also estimated that 98% of everything invented since the dawn of time was invented in the 20th century. This generation certainly qualifies as one in which people move to and fro, and knowledge is increasing at breathtaking speed. At the same time, Daniel was told there would be a refining process. It would occur at the time of unrelenting wickedness. This generation saw the coining of the phrase, mass murder, and another phrase, serial killer. Until 1966, we had no word in our modern lexicon to describe such atrocity. But then Richard Speck entered a nurse's dormitory in Chicago and brutally butchered nine student nurses in a savage orgy of murder and sadism. It was the first time our language failed us in our effort to describe savagery on such an individual level. Today, mass murderers and serial killings are so commonplace they have to compete for space on the front page. Without question, the wicked do more wickedly. More people today turn to Dr. Spock than they do to the Word of God when seeking guidance on how to best bring up babies. The Ten Commandments are barred from the classroom. Evolution and secular humanism are the guiding moral principles of American education. Prayer is forbidden our children. The Supreme Court decision barring God from the classrooms stemmed from the McCullen versus the Board of Education decision in 1948. Today, school shootings are commonplace. Drug abuse is common among every demographic of our society, from grade school students to nursing home residents. The world cries out, why? Remove biblical principles and there is no understanding human behavior. Accept the Bible as God's revealed word and it becomes crystal clear. We're living in the last days. If we are indeed following a predetermined path, then there should be some way of telling how far along we've come. A roadmap will only tell you where you are if you already have several key pieces of information. Knowing where you started and knowing where you're going are necessary in order to figure out where you are. If there's a point where the clock began ticking off this generation, then there must be some way to determine exactly when it began. A generation has a definite starting point, and it runs until everybody born in that generation is dead. If you know when it starts, you can figure out where you are pretty easily. The World War I generation has passed. The World War II generation is approaching its twilight. The baby boom generation is at its prime. And most of the world's leadership today are boomers. Generation Xers are beginning to come into their own, but they still have plenty of time and so on. You get the message. The Bible identifies the last day's generation. 
The evidence is everywhere, but most people don't get it. Remember, Daniel said the wise will understand. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. For most of the world, the Bible is irrelevant. The scripture also says that the things of God are foolishness to those who do not have his spirit. Evolution has replaced creation. Morality is a function of legislation. Those who cry out against abortion, gay rights, and single motherhood are called the extreme right wing of society. Now that should give you a clue right there. The Holocaust displaced the bulk of European Jewry. Now those who survived the death camps had no homes to return to. Immigration to Palestine was strictly limited by the British. Jews smuggled other Jews into Palestine, risking imprisonment or death if they were caught. In 1948, the British mandate to rule Palestine expired. On May 14, 1948, the fig tree blossomed. The Bible is a record of human history, both past and future. It was written from the perspective of hindsight. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, God confirms it. He said, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done as if they were already done. Prophecy is his signature, the proof of the Bible's divine authorship. The countdown to the last days began with the restoration of Israel in 1948. But the Bible predicts far more than just this one miracle. Isaiah 46 verse 10 also says, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. The last day's generation will see the fulfillment of all prophecy from the rise of the Antichrist to the actual second coming of Christ. Well, the world was a much different place in the years following 1948 than it was in the years that came before. Something happened to the whole planet, economically, politically, spiritually, and even ecologically. It was as if the old order things were beginning to fray around the edges, systematically unraveling the social and economic fabric of human society. At the same time, technology stayed one step ahead, setting new trends almost before we knew we needed them. Everything seemed to speed up and coalescence into what looks like a carefully thought out plan. We're moving toward the time the Bible calls the tribulation period. It's during the this time the Antichrist comes to power and seizes political control. At the height of his power, he will exercise absolute control over the political, economic, and spiritual elements of society at every level. Fifty years ago, such control was impossible, or so it seemed. Hitler tried and failed, but today, Everything is in place to bring about just such a society. The government of the Antichrist rests on three pillars, so to speak. A global government, a global religious system, and a global economic society. All three exist in some form today for the first time in history. To argue this is a mere coincidence requires accepting some pretty long odds but the Bible boldly goes where no other book has gone before. All three came into being at the same precise moment in history, just as predicted. Well, in August 1945, President Harry Truman ordered the deployment of America's secret weapon, the atomic bomb. It opened a new era in diplomacy. As long as the U.S. possessed the only working nuclear weapons, war with the U.S. was unthinkable. For too many nations, especially the Stalinist Soviet Union, that was a temporary situation. Now, the Soviets, British, and the French all embarked on separate programs to develop their own nuclear weapons. The era of atomic muscle flexing officially kicked off as a result of the breakdown of the Western Soviet coalition against Hitler's Germany and its allies during World War II. It reached its peak on June 24, 1948. The nations of the London Conference agreed to the creation of a West German state and the establishment of a West German currency by the Western occupying powers. Now in response, the Soviets banned all rail traffic between Berlin and West Germany. 
the Allies organized the Berlin Airlift. The term Cold War was first coined by presidential advisor Bernard Baruch following the Berlin Airlift. That same year, Winston Churchill made his famous Iron Curtain speech. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, Jesus spoke of wars and rumors of wars. Mutual assured destruction meant war was unthinkable, but constantly on the horizon. The Cold War was the ultimate rumor war. In a very real sense, the Cold War began 40 days after the rebirth of the fig tree in the spring of that same year of destiny, 1948. The carnage of World War II touched virtually every life on planet Earth. Israel was reborn in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Without Hitler, Stalin would never have been able to develop his Eastern European empire. The war with Japan provided the impetus for the development of nuclear weapons. There were other victims of the Axis madness, the nations and people who lived under the heel of the Nazi political machine years. Now, nations like Holland, Belgium, and tiny Luxembourg sought out alliances during the post-war reconstruction period. Two world wars in one century were enough. From the ashes of the Nazi occupation, the Benelux Alliance was born in 1948, of course. Holland and Luxembourg and Belgium formed the nucleus for the modern superstate of Europe. Modern Europe is an empire in every sense of the word, a single political entity with the European Commission dictating political and economic policy to the largest single market on earth. The Benelux Treaty provided a war-weary population with another way to harness Europe's economical potential. Now, as its success became apparent, the Benelux Customs Union attracted the attention of other European states. By 1957, three more nations, Italy, West Germany, and Britain, joined under the Treaty of Rome to form the European Economic Community. Now today, the EU is forming its own military machine. Its president, Romano Prodi, hails from Rome. While you would stretch the point to call it a global government now, it certainly has potential, don't you think? Well, it's time for a short review. The Hebrew prophets say the government of the last days would have certain characteristics. It is to be global. It is to be forged not through war, but through mutual agreement. It must rise up out of the ruins of the culture and people of the ancient Roman Empire. Finally, it must emerge during the same generation as the rebirth of Israel. Although the Roman Empire is to revive as a peaceful alternative to military conquest, it must do so during a time of wars and rumors of wars. The model for the modern state of Europe was born in 1948, the same year as the rebirth of Israel. It was codified nine years later by what is now known as the Treaty of Rome. It came into being simultaneously with the emergence of the Cold War, the ultimate rumor of war. If this were the only event predicted by the Bible to take place at the same time as the rebirth of the nation whose history was frozen in time for 2,500 years, it would be astonishing. Well, prepare yourself to be astonished. Well, in order to have a global government, you need a global infrastructure. It's already in place. On April 25, 1945, delegates from 50 nations met in San Francisco for what was officially known as the United Nations Conference on International Organization. Over the next two months, the delegates drafted a 111-article charter that formed the basis for the creation of the United Nations. In December 1948, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UDHR was designed to incorporate the lofty principles of the U.S. Bill of Rights, but deliberately avoided enshrining the purposes that inspired the U.S. document. The U.S. Constitution is carefully worded and constructed. It points out that governments cannot grant rights. Rather, it says these rights were granted by the Creator. The framers of the Constitution felt that because these rights were God-given, the recognition of that fact limited the power of government. The UDHR is designed to do exactly the opposite. Under its terms, the UN grants these rights because the UN does not acknowledge a creator. 
The whole purpose of the UDHR is to empower the United Nations with the authority to govern. You want proof? You don't have to look hard. In the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, it says it all. Article 2 promises, quote, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or status. Now that sounds a little bit like our Constitution until you read the fine print. The needs of the government, even global government, change as times change. What happens to our UN given rights in the event they interfere with the UN's purposes in the future? Article 29, paragraphs 2 and 3 take care of all of that. Article 2, in the exercise of his rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as, as are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. Article 3. These rights and freedoms may in no cases be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Take a look at that again. All these rights and freedoms are granted by the United Nations rather than being inalienable rights granted by God, as our Constitution states. So they can be taken away by the United Nations by the simple expedient of claiming they conflict with the purposes and principles of the United Nations. The World Trade Organization serves as an oversight committee to the global economy. Now it serves the curious job of democratizing nations regardless of economic clout. It serves as the final judge in economic disputes. The U.S. is under its authority under treaty laws passed in Vienna in 1948. Under the World Trade Organization rules, the U.S. vote is of equal weight with, say, that of Mauritania. Or the development of an oversight board like this would be necessary before it would be possible to control the global economy. Now, right now, the job rests in the hands of a few men. Authority that can be given to a few men can be given to one. The United Nations created the global economy by decree using its legislative authority. The GATT, G-A-T-T, Treaty of 1948 that became the World Trade Organization in 1995. This generation has undergone a conditioning process. Those images which were once fanciful and mysterious are now scientifically possible. This generation has been desensitized to biblical imagery. For example, the apocalypse speaks of the image that both moves and speaks. This is a great counterfeit miracle of the Antichrist. In previous generations, there would be no other explanation. It served to distance in their minds the events of the Great Tribulation. After all, it would be during an age of miracles, not during mundane reality. But today, the miraculous, at least technically, is commonplace. This is the age of technical miracles by any human definition, right here, right now. In 1948, Norbert Feiner published his paper, Cybernetics, or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. Cybernetics, according to the dictionary, is the theoretical study of communication and control processes in biological, mechanical, and electronic systems. Now, especially the comparison of these processes in biological and artificial systems. In other words, the science of creating a living machine. Animating an image seems less miraculous. And let's not forget holography, which is defined as a method of producing a three-dimensional image of an object by recording on a photographic plate or film the pattern of interference formed by a split laser beam and then illuminating the pattern either with a laser or with ordinary light. The theoretical technique for constructing the entire image of a recorded object was developed by Dennis Gabor in 1948. Disneyland has been using both techniques to animate President Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. They've been doing this for years. 
What could only be a miracle for generations of Bible commentators has become business as usual since you got the year 1948. In 1948, the rebirth of Israel became the most amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy of modern times. But it was just the first in a series. Jesus promised that the generation that would see the beginning of the end times fulfillment would also see the conclusion of all things. But Israel is not the only event predicted by the Bible for the last days. There is to be a global government, a global economy, a global religious system, and a global leader. The Bible predicts ethnic unrest, famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, and so forth. Jesus warned of strange sights in the heavens, strange weather patterns, and new infectious diseases that also predicted, were predicted as signs of the last days. Now, if this is the last generation, then human history is following a predetermined pattern. The pattern can be traced back to its origin. That pattern began to come together in earnest in 1948. Jesus promised those living at the beginning would see the end. So stay with us as we take you the rest of the way through the 1948 equation. Now all this was set up by a particular incident. Just before Jesus was arrested, he startled his disciples by predicting that Jerusalem and the temple were going to be destroyed. They immediately asked him three questions. Number one, when would this happen? Number two, what would be the signs of the end of the age? And number three, what would be the signs of his coming? His answer uses images and examples that would really only make sense to the generation that would see them all appear together in the same time frame. He predicted that religious deception, hot wars and cold wars, conflicts between ethnic groups and kingdoms, earthquakes, famines and wars, superstorms, and global weather changes would all appear together in the same time frame. Then he gave the key to their uniqueness. He said they would all be like birth pangs. In other words, the events would get more frequent and intense as the end approached. This is an image any generation could understand. It's more than that, though. Think of the odds against accurately predicting all these catastrophic phenomena all appearing and intensifying within one generation. The first widespread use of antibiotics in 1948 transformed the most terrifying diseases known to humanity, tuberculosis, syphilis, pneumonia, bacterial meningitis, and even bubonic plague, into mere inconveniences that if caught in time could be cured with pills or shots. Well, in 1948, two new miracle drugs were developed and introduced to combat former dreaded killers like tuberculosis and staphylococcus. The antibiotics aromycin and chromiacin gave birth to a whole new class of infection-fighting antibiotics that rendered diseases like TB all but extinct in the developed world. But then something happened. Growth hormones in cattle and other food stocks include antibiotics. Food became so laced with antibiotics that antibiotics began losing their effectiveness. By now, nearly every disease organism known to medicine has become resistant to at least one antibiotic and several are immune to more than one. One form of Staphylococcus has developed immunity to all antibiotics, including vancomycin. The question ceased to be, when will infectious diseases be wiped out, and became, where will the next deadly new plague appear? Jesus also said that nation would rise against nation in that generation. Now this is hardly new. Wars have been going on since the beginning of history. But the word translated nation is really the Greek word ethnos, from which we get our word ethnic. The kind of ethnic unrest of our generation is unique to our times. In ancient times, most countries were made up of one ethnic group. Ethnic wars were wars between nations, not internal conflicts. The concept of ethnic melting pot nation is relatively recent. Jesus gave a specific prediction that cuts to the heart of the modern social ills, ethnic unrest. The previous generation saw the Holocaust, Hitler's effort at genocide. 
12 million perished in the Nazi death camps, and 6 million of them were Jews. In this generation, ethnic cleansing is the retail version, smaller and more localized. Hitler combed Europe for his victims. Modern ethnic cleansing efforts are generally confined within national borders. Hmm. Well, for most of the 1990s, the inhabitants of the former Yugoslavia have been busy killing each other as fast as they can buy bullets. The Bosnian War gave us a look inside the first European concentration camps seen since Hitler. Now, mass graves have been uncovered in Bosnia, Kosovo, parts of Serbia, and Croatia. If ever there was a textbook case of a nation torn by ethnic unrest, it would be Yugoslavia. Even the Soviet Union could not control the old ethnic struggles within Yugoslavia. It became the only communist country to ever be expelled from the Soviet's consortium. In 1948, by the way. Freed from Kremlin interference, Tito was able to control the ethnic factions with the ruthless use of power. But when he died, it unraveled along old ethnic lines. 1948 was also the year Pakistan and India, both newly independent, first went to war over Kashmir. The war continues until this very day. Only now, both sides have nuclear missiles. And that makes it even worse, doesn't it? Precisely as predicted, though, ethnic unrest has spread and intensified. Since 1948, ethnic problems have moved to center stage in the global arena. As the various colonial empires were granted independence, a new spirit of ethnic pride was rekindled in nations who had lived for generations under a sort of national schizophrenia. Now, countries previously held together by colonial powers splintered into smaller countries better suited to their ethnic makeup. In 1948, the United Nations was composed of 66 nations. In the years following 1948, an additional 128 countries came into existence. These were not newly discovered countries that had been hidden on the other side of the planet. These were nations carved out of existing countries whose ethnic divisions were so profound they could no longer coexist under the same roof, so to speak. Well, in addition, the old colonial empires began to unravel. For most of the past 200 years, the major European powers invaded, subjugated, and set up colonies in many places around the world. The legacies of colonialism are still apparent on the map. The Dutch Antilles, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British West Indies are some present examples. It was colonialism that gave rise to the saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Before the revolution, the United States was itself a colony of Great Britain. But when Great Britain turned its back on Israel, beginning with the infamous White Paper, which trapped hundreds of thousands of Jews in Nazi Germany, the empire was doomed. The first domino to fall was British Burma. In 1948, they declared their independence from Britain. Because of severe economic problems at home, the British were too strapped to continue their overseas occupations. Now, this reaction opened the floodgates. The same was true of the remaining colonies of Italy, France, Netherlands, and Portugal. It was just too expensive and rapidly becoming politically incorrect. After that, the colonies started disintegrating rapidly. Now, when the last British governor left Hong Kong in 1997, the old British Empire ceased to exist. Since 1948, owning an accurate map of the world has been as temporary as an experience as owning the latest computer to is today, and that's pretty temporary hell. There has always been ethnic unrest. Tribalism is as old as humanity. It didn't suddenly appear out of nowhere in 1948. But consider the scope and intensity of it in this generation. The number of national flags on the planet has tripled since 1948. It was in 1948 that South Africa first launched its official policy of apartheid the cruelest example of official oppression based on race in this century. It is the excess that has attracted global attention. In the United States, the NAACP had long pursued a policy of segregation, calling for a system of separate but equal services for blacks and whites. But it didn't work. Whites enjoyed a disproportionate share of benefits, services, and opportunities that were denied the black population. 
As the excesses became harder to swallow, the NAACP reversed itself. In 1948, the NAACP convention at Kansas City decided to give up the fight for equalization of separate black facilities and push instead for integration. 1948 was also the year that President Harry Truman ordered the forced desegregation of the U.S. Armed Forces. These represented the first shots fired in a war of ethnic parity in this country that continues till this day. South Africa abandoned its apartheid policy in the 1990s, but the killings are now more frequent than before and, of course, along ethnic lines. Well, the Bible speaks of a vast army that the Apostle John refers to as the kings of the East or the kings of the Orient. This is an army so vast that John numbers them at 200 million, an unimaginable number then and almost unthinkable today. This is an army larger than the entire world population when the Apostle John predicted it. But now China has the reserves to field an army of this size all by itself. Korea divided into North and South Korea in 1948. Vietnam divided into North and South Vietnam in 1948. India gave birth to Pakistan in 1948. Mao took China and Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan, setting up a government in exile in 1948. All the 1948 nations of the Orient are big question marks in the year 2000. Not questions like, will we have to fight them? For most analysts, the real question is, when? The Bible also speaks of a time of peace and safety just before the tribulation period. The Apostle Paul writes, when they shall say peace and safety, then there will come sudden destruction. In this new era of peace and safety, it seems almost anything goes. UN invasions of sovereign nations are routine now in the interest of peace and safety. Although the UN is prohibited by its own 1948 charter from interfering in the internal affairs of member states. The Russian invasion of Chechnya became a Russian internal problem in the interest of peace and safety. Israel is about to sign away significant portions of its territories to its traditional sworn enemies in the interest of peace and safety. The real problem is there is no peace and safety. Terrorists have killed more Israelis since the beginning of the peace process than in the period between, between 1948 and 1993. There are more wars and civil wars ongoing today than there were at any time since World War II. There are three times as many nuclear nations today, including undeclared ones, as there was five years ago. Nations like France and China continue to conduct nuclear tests in defiance of test ban treaties they themselves have signed. And Pakistan and India are the two newest members of the nuclear club. This generation is unique in its contradictions. Even as the ethnic unrest is tearing apart nations as diverse as the United States and Canada, or Rwanda and Burundi, Countries' political entities are merging into ever larger trading blocks like NAFTA, Europe and its various sub-blocks, ASEAN and PACRIM. The concept of pace and safety is an illusion and not a particularly clever one at that. Have the various intelligence agencies of the world suddenly become stupid? The Israeli Mossad, the CIA, the KGB, have they suddenly lost the ability to analyze intelligence data? Smuggled nuclear material is turning up daily in the airports of Europe. These deadly materials are en route to terrorist-centered countries like Iran, Iraq, and Syria. The U.S. continues its disarmament, but can it possibly be ignorant of the continued Russian buildup or the meaning of the intense red Chinese nuclear and missile development? A lot of things have happened since the Cold War began back in 1948, and they are all pointing in the same direction. Hmm. Well, high on the list of acts of God that insurance companies are so reluctant to cover is the category of earthquakes. A few years ago, earthquake insurance was rated according to geographic risk. It was much more expensive in California than it was in upstate New York. In recent years, the risk of earthquakes in California have made insurance virtually unavailable. Recent earthquakes in upstate New York have driven premiums out of sight. When asked outright if earthquakes are really increasing, the U.S. Geological Survey categorically denies it. 
But the available evidence, some from their very uh, archives, paints a four different picture. Jesus told us to watch for earthquakes to increase in both frequency and intensity. In the decades following 1948, major earthquake activity tripled. In the last few years, the number of killer earthquakes to hit this planet has gone right off the chart. Not the biggest quakes, but really deadly quakes, measuring more than seven on the Richter scale. Different sources give different figures. I checked out three different almanacs and got three sets of figures. The answers vary depending on the criteria used to define the data. But the answers all show the same disproportionate increase in activity over the same periods of time. And it all began with 1948. Hmm. Well, there's no better way to disguise a poison than to hide it inside a piece of candy. Television has been rightly described as mind candy. Television has the power to shape opinions like no other form of media in history. Through the magic of television, we see transported to the scene images of mangled children in Oklahoma City cut to the core of our national psyche. A skilled writer might write an entire book detailing the bombing in Oklahoma City and not communicate the horror or stir up emotions as effectively as a 15-second soundbite on the nightly news. Television has the capacity to define reality. In the 21st century, reality is not what is true, but what people think is truth. And that's why, to the propagandist, it's the perfect weapon. And that it is. Commercial television made its official debut in 1948 when the invention of the transistor chip revolutionized the technology. Although television technology existed and had been in limited use for a decade or more, it was not until 1948 that television entered into the American mainstream. It was in 1948 that American engineer Claude Shannon perfected the information theory. Information theory deals with the mathematical laws governing the transmission and processing of information. More specifically, information theory deals with the measurement of information and the capacity of communication systems to transmit and process that information. This new technical understanding made possible network television. Well, in 1945, there were only 5,000 television sets in America. They were big, bulky affairs with five-inch screens. They cost between $200 and $600, well out of the reach of most Americans at first. But in the early post-war years, wages shot up dramatically as prices declined or held steady. By the end of 1948, more than a million American homes had TV sets. Ed Sullivan brought the variety show to those million viewers in 1948, and television became part of the American institution. Once the three major networks had been established, the FCC ordered a four-year moratorium on new license. Now, that gave the new networks time to consolidate their holdings. The propaganda vehicle made possible by network television was unequaled in history. The government of the Antichrist would not be possible without television. Remember, this is the age of miracles that unlock the mysteries of Daniel in the book of Revelation. In what other generation could the entire world witness the miracles that are performed by one man? Yet this is what the Bible predicts. The Apostle John also tells us of the Antichrist and unprecedented control of the mass media that he'll have. Now John says the whole world will marvel when he is healed of a deadly head wound. He predicts the whole world will worship this person after that miracle. Such things can only be possible with the advent of television. Today, to control the world, one must control the media. It's much harder to control programming from thousands of individual television stations than it is to control a handful of networks. Cable and satellite companies are finding that out now the hard way. But back in 1948, when TV was in its infancy, there were only three networks controlling all we saw and heard, making the conditioning process very simple. Entertainment programs became platforms for propagating a liberal worldview. Evolution was subtly woven into popular children's programming, and issues like abortion, feminism, gay rights, and euthanasia were embedded in the plots of prime-time dramas. Gradually, the American public grew to accept these things as being normal. 
those who held to a biblical worldview were ridiculed. Homosexuality was always considered morally wrong in America. Teenage pregnancy and illegitimacy were always frowned upon. Abortion had always been considered murder. So it was for two centuries of Americans. But something happened. American moral values reversed in a single generation, the 1948 generation. Hmm. Well, television was not invented by shadowy figures in high places seeking to prepare the world for the Antichrist. The media is not openly controlled by any one group of conspirators who desire to help Satan. There are a number of special interest lobbies in Washington. Most of them don't even believe in the Bible, much less Satan. Their selfish interests just happen to coincide with those foreseen for the last days. They simply recognize television as an effective platform to use for educating the masses to a message they think is right. Most would scoff at the suggestion the American media was really a propaganda machine. Most at least, but not all. Just the ones who watch too much TV. <laughs> well, a central theme for the last days revolves around the issue of communication. The prophet Daniel was told the vision was sealed until the knowledge was increased. Then Jesus spoke of the signs of the times. He alluded to global communications. He told his disciples that they would hear of calamities like wars, earthquakes, and pestilences in various places. He made reference to events that would be seen worldwide all at the same time. He spoke of men's hearts failing them for fear at these reports. They did not ap apply even 100 years ago. The signs in the sun, moon, and stars that he referred to in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, demand some kind of a global visual communication system. He said those signs would cause the distress of the nations. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars in generations past would only be visible to, at best, one half of the world's population at any given time and then only if all were outside gazing skyward simultaneously. Jesus even went so far as to connect his return to the advent of global communications. He told his disciples, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. Well, the earliest working computer was called the ENIAC. It was built between 1943 and 1946 for the U.S. military by two Americans, physicist John Prisper Eckhart and electrical engineer John Motchley. It was the first large-scale general-purpose electronic computer. It had one drawback, of course. Since it used vacuum tubes, it used enough electricity to power a small city, making it essentially useless. 1948 was the year the computer age was born. Bell Labs and AT&T developed the transistor that year, and before year's end, the Univac was unveiled. Transistors were small, reliable, and energy efficient. Computers found their way into banks. Banks linked to one another. Borders disappeared, and the global economy was born. The UN recognized that a global economy needed a global authority and created the GATT, or GATT. Now, that was in 1948, of course, the same year as the birth of the World Bank and the IMF. Hmm. There's one other element central to these last day governments. The apocalypse predicts, quote, the whole world will worship this man called the Antichrist, end quote. This means worship in the sense of a religious worship. The Roman Antichrist has a partner that is called the false prophet. The ancient Hebrew prophets speak of this false prophet and they say that he'll be a Jew who claims to be the Messiah for the Israelites. He will lead the Gentile world and the Israelites to both worship the Roman leader eventually as God. The Apostle John predicts that the world will worship the Roman Antichrist and the one who gives his power to him, Satan. It will be a new universal religion. I realize that for some of you, this all sounds wild. But three-fourths of the prophecies in which these things were predicted have already literally come true in history. The dictionary defines religion as belief in and reverence for a supernatural power or powers regarded as creator and governor of the universe. 
So according to the dictionary, a religion must have a belief system that incorporates the obvious, like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and so forth. But what about atheism or secular humanism? Secular humanism is the core belief that man is the supreme being of planet Earth, the proud product of evolution. According to the Supreme Court, humanism is a religion. The American Humanist Association certifies humanist counselors who enjoy the same legal status as ordained priests, pastors, and rabbis. Humanism is not only accepted as a religion with full religious 501c3 tax exemptions, but the Supreme Court upheld Daniel Seeger's right to claim conscientious objector status, exempting him from military service because of his religious beliefs. His religious belief cited before the court was secular humanism. Well, secular humanism is the only religious belief structure that can be legally taught in the American public school systems. That's right, folks. Humanist teachers recognize the potential for converts among the young and impressionable minds of students. In 1948, the theory of evolution received two major boosts. The first was the introduction of the Big Bang Theory that provided a pseudoscientific explanation for the origin of the universe. Prior to the development of the so-called Big Bang, evolutionists still had a major unexplainable problem. They came up with the explanations for the Earth like a spinning ball of mag magnetically charged particles stuck together. Life on Earth was the result of evolution or natural selection. But there was still no explanation for where the universe itself came from, apart from an intelligent creator. The second problem was how to get this information in front of impressionable students. Many students still believed in God, and often the school day began with a prayer to Him. Educators were faced with the problem of officially acknowledging a Creator at 9 a.m., then trashing Him for the rest of the school day. The Supreme Court settled that issue in a decision entitled McCollum versus Board of Education. The decision was handed down in 1948, and all religions except secular humanism were banned from the classroom. The court ruled that in public schools, a period of silence may be observed in which children may pray if they want. But the schools were forbidden to conduct devotional exercises, compose prayers, read the Bible, or otherwise enter the field of religious instruction. That was interpreted to mean acknowledging any divine hand in the creation of the universe or its contents was entering the field of religious instruction. 1948 was the year America handed God his walking papers. Over the past decades, the World Council of Churches has been a champion of ecumenism. Ecumenism is the bringing together of all the world's religions under one roof. It was to that end that the World Council of Churches was formed in Amsterdam in 1948. Working closely with the United Nations, the WCC claims in its constitution to be a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the scriptures and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit." End quote. However, its constitution also includes the interesting provision for its member churches, and that is, quote, the right not to believe in God also must be protected, end quote. The infrastructure necessary to fulfill John's prediction of a global apostate church is alive and well under the UN protection. Under WCC rules, there's room for humanists, shamans, and animists of all kinds. They'd certainly have room for one more, and that is the religion the Antichrist will bring into the world. As you've seen, there's plenty of evidence to suggest 1948 was more than just another year in the turbulent 20th century. It was a pivotal year, economically, politically, and socially. It can be argued that it was the birth year of the world's three greatest institutions, the year the UN granted conditional humanitarian universal rights, the year the UN instituted the global government by creating GATT to oversee it, the year the U.S. government turned over control of the airwaves to the executives of three hand-picked networks. 1948 was a year that the ultimate rumor of war began with a Berlin airlift. It was the year the first truly functional computer was introduced. It was the year the world began to divide itself along ethnic lines.
It was the year that, for the first time in 2,000 years, the nation of Israel reappeared on the map of nations. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to God except through me. Now he didn't say that to be narrow or to be intolerant. He said that because he's the only one who ever visited this planet that could qualify to die for our sins. And he willingly did pay for them and purchase a pardon for everyone. Now he has a pardon with your name on it reserved for you in heaven. And he has it there just waiting for you to claim it. But you must claim it. So as you think about how accurate prophecy has been, how so much has been fulfilled, even starting with this era that began in 1948, it shows the Bible is really true, that you can count on what it says. And so right now, stop and seriously think, have I ever received the pardon that Jesus gave his life to pay for and to purchase for me. He said, as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So I invite you to do what millions of others have done, to accept the pardon which the Son of God paid for with his own life. If you do, you'll change instantly your eternal destiny. Right now, in the quiet of your heart, just simply say, thank you, Jesus Christ, for dying for me. I confess I can never be good enough for God to accept. So I received the pardon you paid for. Come into my life. I accept that pardon. And I thank you for eternal life because you promised you would give it. And when you do, if you did that, then I'll tell you right now, you won't be here when the coming Holocaust takes place. Right now, you have been delivered and will not be here when all of these things that we see developing now begin to take place. God bless you. And I pray that I'll see you with that great throne that stands at his feet.